All right, we are back in Matthew's Gospel. We're in Matthew chapter 27. Uh, we've just completed our look the last few weeks of Christ on the cross and his experience on the cross. And we looked at the first three hours, then we looked at the second three hours, right up until the time of his death. And so that's where we're starting, at the time of his death. And we're going to be talking about the, the, the things that happened around it and the witnesses of his death. So, we're in... Um, We're in Matthew 27, but as I have been doing, I'm going to use all of the Gospels. Uh, And last time we sort of ended talking about John chapter 19, and we focused on the significant declaration that Jesus made just before yielding his spirit to the Father when he said, it is finished. That expression is one word in the Greek, tetelestai. It's so funny how things happen. I was... uh, scrolling down through my Facebook page and an ad came up for with a t-shirt that said Tetelestai on it. And I was thinking, wow, how do they know what I'm preaching on? You know, they know all about your life and those things, they, all these ads that come up. But anyway, it was, I thought that was kind of funny. But that word means it's all done. Everything is complete. Very common word in first century Roman the Roman Greco culture. It's a Greek word, but Greek was the common language in the Roman Empire. That's what most people spoke. Because Latin was kind of an odd language. So the Romans spoke Latin, but everybody spoke Greek. So Jesus would have known Greek rather than Latin. And he said um, that word. Uh, But let me just tell you how some of the ways it was used commonly. If, If a servant completed his job and reported back to his master, he would say, Tetelestai. It's all done. It's all completed. I've done my job. If an artist completed a sculpture or a painting or a writer completed a manuscript and finally had finished revising it and brought it to its final form, to tell us die. It's finished. When a priest examined an animal for sacrifice, like in the Jewish temple, and found it spotless, he might say, to tell us die. It's complete. It's everything it needs to be. So Jesus was the perfect sinless lamb of God. Jesus finished the work that the Father had given him to do. Uh, when a, um, he, he was the complete picture of all the things that the Old Testament had prophesied in words, in events like the sacrifice of Isaac, uh, which was a type of Christ's sacrifice, uh, the rituals in the law of Moses. All of those things are pointing to the sacrifice of Christ. So he completes all of that. It's, it's all the promise of, of a coming savior and he's the completion of that promise. So all of it points to Jesus death. So the cross explains all the Old Testament rituals, sacrifices and symbols, all those things woven into the law of Moses into the life of Israel. Most interesting to tell us I was used in business as well. So when a merchant paid off a debt in full, he would happily declare to tell us die it's finished those are good days aren't they when you've got a debt paid off and you can say it is finished last payment so that kind of an idea too well jesus paid our debt our debt that uh we have to god's justice because of our sin which is a major debt it's a serious debt it's a soul damning debt and we can't pay it because the requirement to be with God is perfection. And once you've got that debt to him, you can't pay it yourself. So Jesus paid it for us. So he makes us righteous, perfect in the eyes of God by paying the debt that we owe to divine justice. So that's where Tetelestai comes in. And that's why he said it from the cross. It was one of the last things he said. So the sacrifices of Israel, all those ritual sacrifices, they could never solve the sin problem. How could they? Because we're always in debt. But they served as a sign to point to the one who would solve the problem. So when the work is done and the debt is paid and justice is satisfied, Jesus says to Telestai. Okay, so that's the theological truth and that's the foundational truth of the cross and what was accomplished there for us. And that is a truth you need to hold close to your heart whenever you meditate or think about the cross of Jesus or read the narrative of the crucifixion, that that's what it's all about. It is finished. Our salvation has been accomplished in Jesus. But that's not the end of the story. 
So I want to continue on now with the things that immediately happened after Jesus died. So it's still Friday. Uh, Wonderful things are coming, especially on Sunday. But even in the moments and hours immediately following the death of Jesus, some really fascinating things happened. And we have an opportunity today, uh, similar to the one we had leading up to the crucifixion, Because when we were doing that, we saw a lot of other people, characters uh, that were part of the events of that day. Judas and Peter and Anas, the former high priest, and Caiaphas, the current high priest, and Pontius Pilate, and um, Herod, Antipas, and all all those people. Well, just like that, following the cross, we see the impact of what happened there on other people. People and things around it because God is moving in a very powerful way. So the most significant event by far is a miracle that in every way confirms Jesus' death and what it accomplished in that it satisfied the wrath of God and saved us from our debt of sin and paid that off. So the work is complete. It's finished. Christ was the only sacrifice needed to redeem our souls and satisfy the demands of God's justice. And this event is very important because of what it represents. So Matthew mentions it. Mark mentions it. Luke mentions it. And um, in Matthew, it's in 27 verse 50. So let me just kind of read that for you. It says, Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and yielded up his spirit. So Luke tells us what he said there, and Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Matthew just mentions that in a general way. And then verse 51, it says, And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. So earthquakes are not usually timed at the moment of the exact death of a criminal being crucified. So This is obviously something God had ordained. It's a powerful miracle. It's certainly impactful that it coincides at the moment of the death of a man above whose head is a sign reading King of the Jews, right? So the king dies and the earth shakes. That's a miracle. But that's not the most significant event. The veil of the temple is the significant thing. With the earthquake came this amazing rending of this veil in the temple. Now, this veil, it isn't like a piece of gauze. It's not like a bridal veil or something like that. You can't grab it and tear it. Um, We don't know everything about it, but Josephus, who lived in the first century, he was a Jewish historian, his description is that the, this veil uh, that was in the temple was 60 feet long and 30 feet high and was made up of 72 squares that were joined together. He said it was as thick as the palm of a human hand and it required 300 priests just to adjust it or move it. So we're talking about something that's huge and incredibly heavy and you can't tear it. No human being could tear it or it would take um, some kind of industrial equipment to tear it. And it was a massive thing. And it just tore, tore right in two, top to bottom. Verse 51 says, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. 30 feet of this massive heavy thing just torn apart. Why did God do that? What is the significance of that? How does that relate to Jesus' death? Those are good questions and I'm glad you asked. So we want to ask, what did the veil do? That's where we start with that kind of answer for that. What was it for? Why was there a veil in the temple? Well, this all began in the tabernacle way back 1400 years before the time of Christ where God ordained the worship format for the Jewish people. And the tabernacle was a portable worship center for Israel that God designed and explained to Moses exactly how it was to be made. And it was the place where Moses' brother Aaron would serve as a high priest and then the Levitical priests would offer their sacrifices there. That was the center of their worship. It was the center of their camp as well because they were a nation on the move. Later, after David conquered Jerusalem, God told Solomon, David's son, to make a permanent structure with the same pattern as the tabernacle so that that would become a permanent temple 
in God's holy city. So the temple in Jesus' time was actually the third temple. Solomon's temple was destroyed. Another short-term temple was put up that wasn't too spectacular. And then Herod the Great, the, the man that tried to kill Jesus as a child, he built this magnificent, one of the great buildings of the ancient world, this magnificent temple, which was being worked on for decades and was still wasn't finished in Jesus' time, but it was a massive, incredible thing. It was a wonder of the ancient world. But that had the veil too because since Moses time the veil was there what was the veil there for it was to block access to the inner parts of the temple so you had a curtain that went all the way around the original tabernacle and there's walls around the temple and so there's only one door to go in and when you go you come to the place of the altar and then a, a place of washing and then the holy place where priests would go in every day, a couple times a day to take care of the worship going on there and they would offer sacrifices inside of there. And then behind the, there was another room called the Holy of Holies and this veil was protecting the Holy of Holies. And only one person could go into the Holy of Holies once a year and that was the high priest and that was to offer sacrifice on the Day of Atonement and sprinkle blood in that room. There was one article of furniture in that room. Do you remember what it was? The Ark of the Covenant. So if you saw Raiders of the Lost Ark, you, you know that that's not something you don't open. But um, that was what uh, represented God's place. So if you remember when the Israelites were moving, there was a f- pillar of fire at night and a pillar of cloud by day over the tabernacle. And the, the actual presence of God in a visual way was there in that room. But nobody was ever there, but it was still there. So God was present among his people. That's what tabernacle means, a a dwelling place. God dwelt among his people. And that's what that veil did. It said you can't come into God's presence. So again, only once a year could a priest, the high priest, go in beyond that veil where the Ark of the Covenant was. It all said you can't come near me. Because you're a sinner. You have sin. And you can only approach me through blood. So that was the significance of all of that. The, the one door. The sacrifices. All that approach. So the veil says sinners cannot approach except through blood. And when Jesus said to Telestai and surrendered his life. That veil was torn in two. Can you understand why? Because now sinners can approach God. The debt is paid. The sacrifice is done. All of those sacrifices pointed to the real Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The sacrifice of Jesus. So once that sacrifice was complete there's nothing to keep us from approaching God because we have the righteousness of Christ credited to us. That is the great truth of the gospel right there. So his blood is what everything pointed to. The blood of Jesus. All the animal blood didn't do anything. It pointed to Jesus. And his death truly washes us clean of our sin. And gives us the status of righteous men and women. Who can approach God with confidence. In fact the book of Hebrews says to approach with confidence. Not because we're good. But because Christ's death was all sufficient for our sin. So we can approach God as his beloved children. It's a beautiful, wonderful thing. So direct access to God is now available for all who are in Christ, who have put their faith in Christ. That is the new covenant that Jesus inaugurated. You know, the new covenant's not a New Testament idea. It's an Old Testament idea. In fact, it comes right out of the book of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah, let me give you the key words of it. It's kind of a lengthier section. I just want to read you the core part of it. Jeremiah chapter 31 it says this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days declares the Lord I will put my law within them and on their heart I will write it and I will be their God and they shall be my people and then he says for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more one thing every human being should want is for God to not remember their sin anymore most people don't care But if you do care and you bring yourself to Christ and humble yourself before him and accept his offer of salvation and acknowledge him as your king, you are forgiven forever and God will not remember your sins. 
So in the New Testament, the writer to the book of Hebrews, which is written to Jewish Christians, quotes the new covenant promise from Jeremiah. And he says, this is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10. We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. When you sit, you're done, right? And that's another clear picture of a completed work. He's done. He sits down. And then it says in Hebrews 10, 13, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. That is the most incredible truth. That you are secure, sanctified, saved by Jesus, by the blood of Jesus. That's why we sing about blood in Christianity. Because his blood is precious. In fact, uh, Peter says it's more precious than gold and anything else you can think of. Jesus said that God will be worshipped in spirit and in truth. So there's no more veil. There's no more animals to kill. There's none of that's go- done anymore. Why isn't it done anymore? Because he fulfilled all of it. It all pointed to him. And because he is a high priest and the only mediator between God and man, there's no more formal human priesthood that's necessary because he's the one mediator I am a pastor I am not a priest I have nothing like that I have no access to God that's any different than any other Christian has I'm not closer to him than any other Christian can be so Peter says in his epistle we are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. So we all have this priesthood. All Christians are part of this holy priesthood. One of the great benefits of the Protestant Reformation was to return to the biblical idea that all believers are priests in the sense that we all have access to God directly. We don't have to go through some human or some uh, organization or anything like that. We all have equal access to God through Christ alone. And that priesthood is directly tied to the work that he accomplished on the cross. So that belief actually, it actually changed church furniture. I don't know if you know that. If you go into a a Catholic church today, you'll see in the middle is an altar. On the side is a pulpit. But after the Protestant Reformation, that pulpit got moved to the center. Why? Because we don't make sacrifices anymore um, the, the, the Christ is our sacrifice. He's, he fulfilled everything. So the pulpit moved to the center because the most important thing to happen is to proclaim the finished work of Christ, not to offer some other kind of sacrifice. So that's what it was, that's what changed. So the pulpit is the center because we make proclamation of what Jesus actually did. He is our sacrifice. Never forget that. And his sacrifice has done the job. May he be glorified in all things. Okay, so the earth shook, the veil was torn, and then something even more remarkable happened. And I wish Matthew had said more about it, and he's the only one that talks about it. He is, what I guess you would say, madding, maddenly brief. I mean, it drives you crazy he's so short about it. It's because if you want to know more about it. But um, if you have a curious mind... It's going to bother you. But I think he had to be brief because this is, even though this is amazing, it's not the central thing that happened. It's a witness to the amazing central thing that happened, which is Christ dying for our sins. This is a side thing, but it's, it kind of lights up the imagination. But here it is, uh, verse 52 of Matthew 27. The tombs were opened. So the veil's torn, the earthquake happens, the rocks are split. The tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep, that means dead, were raised. And coming out of the tombs, after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. So that's all he says. And he's the only one that talks about it. 
And that is a real problem for some people. Some people are very disturbed by this. It's like, uh, I'm not totally sure why. It does raise a lot of questions, and those questions are not answered, so I guess that bothers people. Who exactly was raised? Well, it says the saints, so that gives us some idea. How many were there? Well, it says many, but many could be 10. It could be 150. Uh, it, how many is that? What happened to these people afterward? It doesn't say. And what does it mean? All of those are really good questions, and they're kind of left unanswered. And that just throws some people for a loop. In fact, one of the leading academic apologists for Christianity today, a man who debates atheists and Muslims and all sorts of people, his name's William Lane Craig, and he's very well known. He has a horrible problem with this passage. And uh, he says it probably didn't happen. He said it's probably some sort of myth or uh, some kind of spiritual truth that uh, didn't actually happen. And... Uh, I think the biggest reason for his doubt is that it's just so amazing, but it doesn't give any details. And like I said, the other gospel writers don't mention it at all. But there's a big problem denying that this happened when you have no reason to deny it because it's in the Bible. He's, he spends a lot of his time defending the resurrection. And then, and then he says the thing that happened right before the resurrection is probably some sort of mythological uh, untrue thing. You know who loves him? Muslims. The Muslims he debates love him because he just denied something Matthew says that happened right before the resurrection, which William Lane Craig says the resurrection definitely happened. But he says this, there's something weird about this. I have no idea why he feels that way except that it's just, he, it's an embarrassment to him for some reason because we don't know enough about it. I think the biggest reason for that doubt is the fact that there's so little detail and that the other gospel writers don't mention it. But all the gospels, all the gospels, except for Mark, Mark is sort of a boiled down combination of Matthew and Luke. So there's hardly any unique material in, in Mark's gospel. But all the gospels, all the other gospels have amazing things that happened in the life of Jesus that aren't recorded in the other ones. Because as John says at the end of his gospel, he did so many th amazing things that n all the books in the world couldn't contain them. So it's not surprising that one gospel will tell things that the other gospels don't. I mean, a scroll is only so long. So they have to pick and choose what they're going to include and they make their own editing choices. But Matthew's very clear about this. There's no textual issues here. It's right there in his gospel. And I can get why Matthew would keep it brief and not give a lot of explanation because what's the focus of all of this? It's Christ. And what he did. So this is sort of ancillary to all that kind of stuff. It's sort of extra. And if you spend a lot of time on this event happening. It could be sort of a sideshow. But he does want to tell us that it happened. And I can't say much about it. Because I don't know. But uh, it's here. And it's wonderful. It's a wonderful story. I can say that resurrections happened in Jesus' ministry. So it's not that shocking. Uh, Lazarus was resurrected. The widow of Nan's. Uh, son was resurrected. Jairus' daughter was resurrected. Even in the Old Testament, there are three resurrections of individuals that had died. God used the prophet Elijah to raise a young boy from death, 1 Kings 17. Elisha raised the son of the woman of Shunem and uh, 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings 13, 21. A dead body was thrown into Elisha's grave and it came back to life. So uh, some rather remar remarkable things happened in the Old Testament as well. It touched Elijah's bones and came back to life. Elisha's bones. So things like that happen and it's very appropriate that they should happen in a bigger way on the very day that Jesus set men free from the bondage to sin and death. I mean, it's very appropriate that this would happen. So... He paid the penalty of our sins. They're done. Let's bring up some bodies to tell people about it. That's what happened. So I guess scholars like Craig are just bothered that there aren't all other kinds of... Another thing I think he would think is this. Something that dramatic or important, there would be a record of it in other places. But you know why? That's just not true. I mean, there probably was a record of it in other places, but we have almost nothing from the first century. I mean, the amount of material that actually exists from the first century is very slight, very slight. I'm reading this book on the Roman Empire right now. They have to go to Josephus, whose works did survive, a Jewish historian, to tell us what was going on in Rome. 
because there's so little of all of that world that survived. Records didn't survive. Government documents didn't survive. Very little. You have to piece together little tatters and rags is the way they describe the ancient world because we know so little about it really. Um, not much survived. So there could have been all kinds of things written about this incident and stories told about it and all kinds of things like that. We don't have them. They didn't survive. Even Pontius Pilate's governorship has only a few mentions in writing. I mean, he was a governor there in Judea for a long time. Although there is a marvelous stone that was found excavated in Jerusalem that has his name on it as the governor. I actually saw that stone personally when it was at the LA Museum. So we know he was real and all of that, but we don't have any documents about him, uh, the Roman reports about him or what happened or anything. We don't have that. It was all destroyed over time. So there just aren't that many things. So it's not fishy or anything like that that this uh, isn't known in other places. It's, it's not fishy. It's exciting. And I wish we had more, but we don't. And that's okay. It is really interesting that the earthquake opened the tombs for them. And it's really interesting that they waited until after the resurrection to kind of walk into town and go into Jerusalem. And they were saints. They were holy ones. They were believers. Some speculate that they were speculate that they were recently buried people like Lazarus, uh, not that long in the tombs, but we don't know that either. We just don't know. So they conclude that like Lazarus, maybe they lived out the rest of their lives and then, and then died. We don't know that. But let's stay with what we do know. God did this miracle to bear witness to what Christ had accomplished. That's what matters. And God held this witness back until Sunday. So these people didn't come in and talk to people until Jesus was resurrected. So it's a witness to his death for sin because it happened at that moment and it's a witness to his resurrection because that's when they showed up in town. So um, it's really an amazing thing. Now some things everybody experienced when the darkness came over the land during Jesus' last three hours everybody experienced that. Everyone felt the violence of the earthquake at the moment Jesus died. Add to that just Jesus himself or all the people were, that were there at the crucifixion and watching him, hearing him, um, his dignity, his forgiveness, his compassion, his words to the other thief, his words about um, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All of that, all those people there heard that and saw all of that. And all of those things led to another witness that we have, a person who was there at the crucifixion. And that's the man that was assigned and given the responsibility to make sure Jesus was put to a cruel death. So it's the Roman centurion. He saw all of it. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all talk about him. And each gives a little bit of extra detail about him. So we're going to look at Matthew's, Matthew 27, 54, so the earthquake happens. The sky's been dark. Rocks are split. He doesn't know about the tombs yet. Now the centurion and those who were with him keeping guard over Jesus when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening became very frightened and said truly this was the son of God. So they're frightened. All of the Romans are frightened. But the centurion comes to a definite conclusion despite all of Jesus' accusers and all the things they said about him and their constant mockery of him while he was on the cross, this soldier saw it all and concluded truly, certainly, without question, this was the Son of God. That's an amazing witness. Now, it's the Son of God could legitimately be translated a son of God. If he had a pagan view of this whole thing, he may have said that. Truly, this is a son of the gods or a son of God. But um, it's also right to translate it the son of God. We don't know, but that doesn't matter. The point is he was overwhelmingly convinced that this was a miraculous deity of some kind. This is an amazing person. He's, he's a God-like being. This is how Mark describes it. Mark chapter 15, verse 39 when the centurion, and he gives a wonderful detail, when the centurion who was standing right in front of him, being Jesus, saw the way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. 
So all the Romans were frightened, but the centurion was standing right in front of Jesus and watched carefully Jesus' last seconds. So I think he plainly saw that Jesus didn't just die, but he gave up his life. It was that final moment that moved his heart so much. Now Luke tells us a little bit more. Luke chapter 23 verse 47. It says when the centurion saw what happened. He began praising God saying certainly this man was innocent. So first he was praising or glorifying God by saying that Jesus was innocent. Now it's possible that he said praise God and he was actually glorifying God. But it seems to be the grammar seems to be saying he, he glorified God. The word really is glorified. He glorified God by saying that Jesus was innocent. So um, he was declaring him innocent. In fact, that word innocent in Greek culture was used, um, is, it means righteous. So we could have been saying this man was truly righteous. The Greeks used the word righteous as a declaration of innocence. So it's uh, appropriate to use it either way or translate it either way. The verb is really interesting because it's in the present tense. And when something you're talking about that happened in the past is given a present tense, it means it went on for a while. So he didn't just say, hey, surely this guy's innocent. He's, or he's truly the son of God. It, it's, it means he was making a point of it. He was going on about it. So he was declaring it to everybody. He gave a talk, if you will, or said it to many people over a course of a few minutes or something like that. So you can imagine the crowd as this centurion, a Roman captain, says, truly this man was the son of God. Certainly he was innocent. Did you know? Can you see how innocent he was? This man was righteous. Did you hear? He's righteous. So, so he's given like a talk to everybody. He's telling them all what's, what's going on. So it wasn't just a declared one thing. He was telling them this. How do they react? Well, the next verse in Luke says, and all the crowds who came together for this spectacle, when they observed what had happened, began to return beating their breasts. So they're going home. And they're doing this. They're beating their breasts. Now every place in the gospels where it talks about somebody beating their breasts that is an act of contrition and guilt and sorrow. So they're feeling remorse about what they did. So they begin to break up and now we're seeing guilt on their faces. They beat their breasts an act of contrition. Maybe he was innocent. What have we done? Those kind of thoughts are creeping into the minds of many people there after this Roman makes this declaration. Were the high priests and the elders that were mocking Jesus involved in this contrition? Well, if you read the book of Acts, it doesn't sound like it because they treat the apostles just as bad as they wanted to treat Jesus. But this contrition here might help explain why Peter's sermon 40 days later on the day of Pentecost was so successful. I mean, 3,000 people came to the Lord from that one sermon. And there was a sermon right after that, a little chapter later, where many thousands more come to Jesus. So uh, it's very likely that these people were already feeling something bad about what they had done to Jesus and that Jesus was God's son and there's something going on there. And then when Peter kind of nails it down in, in Pentecost and he says, this is J- God's son whom you crucified then they feel guilt and they say, what shall we do? And he says, repent, you know, and be baptized. So there's a lot of prep work going on here. God is plowing hearts and getting them ready for the gospel. They don't understand yet, but now they're seeing that something horrible has been done. Something horrible has happened. What about the priests? Well, Acts chapter 6 verse 7 says a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith as well. So some of them may have been part of this crowd that was feeling this way and beating their breast. So the priests especially, because even if they weren't at the cross, guess what they did see? In the temple where they did their ministry, they're the ones that saw the torn veil. Some people may have been there and seen the veil torn. But when they went into the holy place to do their regular thing, uh, lighting the, the candelabra and putting new bread on the table of showbread and offering incense on the, I mean that giant veil, that curtain is just 
ripped asunder. They would have seen that, talked about that. That would have been the absolute discussion. Well, when did that happen? Well, that happened when the earthquake happened. When did that happen? That happened the moment Jesus died. So it's not surprising that many priests became Christians not too far after this. Does contrition suggest saving faith on the part of the crowd? No, probably not. We, we learned from Judas that remorse does not equal faith. But like I said, God is plowing up hard soil. So hard hearts are being softened. So many will be ready when Peter preaches the word and they will become Christians and they will be saved by that. So the remorse itself is not saving, but that's a good place to be to realize that we sinned against Jesus and we all sin against Jesus. We all put him on the cross by our sin. So if we feel the remorse for that, then the best thing to do is to take the next step, right? And come to him for salvation, to have that access to God, the holy God who will look at you as pure because of Jesus' blood. Okay, can you handle one more witness? Well, just one more thing. Let me point you to one more witness, and this is the witness of forensic medicine. Huh? People would have been starting to drift away after Jesus died but, and beating their breasts and all of that, but this would have been seen by the soldiers who had to stay there, the women uh, with Jesus' mother, and the apostle John. So this is a, back in John chapter 19, verse 31. Says then the Jews because it was the day of preparation so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath for the Sabbath was a high day asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Typically if you were crucified by the Romans you would be exposed until you died. You died by exposure and just not being able to handle it anymore. Your body would just give out and sometimes it took a couple of days. But a typical Roman uh, way of ruling their empire was to make concessions to the local laws and customs of the people. So they didn't want to unnecessarily offend people. So in this case, Jewish law was that you were not to have anybody um, hung like that uh, during the Sabbath. So it had to be done by 6 o'clock at night. That's when Sabbath starts. So in mid-afternoon in order to kill the men more quickly and get them buried before sundown which is what Jewish custom required when the Sabbath began the soldiers would break the legs of the men being crucified. It's a very cruel way to make things go quicker instead of just stabbing them or something they have to make them suffer even more but it does speed things up. So on a cross you have to use your legs because you can't breathe when you're in that position so you have to push on your feet to, to catch breath and your lungs are gasping for air and if your legs are broken you can't do that anymore so you die of asphyxiation pretty quickly. So they decide to do that they're going to break their legs and uh, when they come to Jesus they find out he's already dead and then if you skip down to verse 32 it says so the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and of the other who was crucified with him but coming to Jesus when they saw that he was already dead they did not break his legs. So one soldier wants to make sure that Jesus died so he runs a spear up into his chest cavity. Then in verse 36 it says these things came to pass to fulfill the scripture. Not a bone of him shall be broken and another scripture says they shall look on him whom they have pierced. We've already talked about that one in the past. But not a bone of him shall be broken is from Psalm 34 20 but most importantly it was the rule that the Passover lamb um, in the law of Moses not have its bones broken. So this is Exodus 12, right when the Passover was first inaugurated, verse 46, it says, it is to be eaten in a single house. You are not to bring forth any of the flesh outside the house, nor are you to break any bone of it. So the Passover lamb is not to have its bones broken. And Christ is the Passover lamb. So it was proper and right that his bones not be broken. So again it's a timing thing. He, God timed that his death would come before the moment when they were going to go around and break everybody's legs. So it didn't happen because he is the true Passover lamb who takes away the sin of the world and he should not have his bones broken. So that was um, all necessary all of that. But the most interesting thing about 
this moment is the description of what flowed out when Jesus was speared by the Romans. The spear was thrust into his side. So if you back up to verse 34, it says, One of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And then look at verse 35. It's really interesting. He who has seen has testified. So John is talking. He's writing this gospel. He who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth so that you also may believe. So he's testifying to these last um, moments there on the cross before Jesus is taken down. And John makes a note here, a special note, that he's witnessed this. And it's rather unusual in its emphasis. And it doesn't seem to be talking about necessarily the whole thing, but, but this, uh, what this soldier's act was. Now, it does encompass everything. He was there for everything. But... Um, he doesn't say why he's emphasizing this spear point, but uh, blood and water. That's just odd that that would happen. Because if you, a d- person's already dead and you run a spear up into him, you're going to get a little trickle out of him. But there's definitely two flows here, a flow of a clear liquid and a flow of blood coming out of Jesus' body. There's a sac that surrounds the human heart. It's called the pericardium, pericardium. Peri always means around, and cardia is heart, right? Cardiac. So this sac around the heart, under certain conditions, will fill with a clear fluid. And that clear fluid, as it grows in there, compresses the heart and puts pressure on the heart. We don't know for sure if a crucifixion would cause that kind of action. Um, Doctors and medical experts and people that think about this stuff disagree about whether or not that would would do that. And it's it's hard to get clear evidence because nobody volunteers to do this to make sure it would happen or not. So, um, and it doesn't happen to people generally that we can examine. So, uh, but some do believe that the trauma that Jesus experienced, both in being flogged and then being crucified, might cause this to happen. But nobody can know the trauma that Jesus went through in bearing our sin. I mean, that is a trauma that the other men being crucified did not experience. And that is simply beyond our comprehension, what he endured to bear the sin of the world and have the Father's wrath poured out on him. So it's very possible that this physical affliction, because he was a true human being, actually came upon him and that his heart was being compressed by his, the pericardium filling with some kind of fluid. Um, interestingly, Psalm 22, which we've talked about in quite a bit of detail the last two times we've met here, um, and rem- remember, it's, it's the crucifixion from the Messiah's point of view, from Jesus' point of view, Psalm 22 is. In Psalm 22:14, he says, my heart is like wax. It is melted within me. So whatever that means, what, what that, to use those words to describe what he's feeling about his heart, it kind of adds to the possibility that that's what's going on here. Remember, he's a real human being who's endured something beyond our comprehension, and that could well describe um, this pressure on his heart from this incredible thing that he went through. So the pericardium would have this clear liquid, and the heart would, of course, be full of blood. And so when that spear goes up in there, it would pierce through both of those things, and they would stream out at the same time. So that might be something that John is making the point about. He's saying, look, I saw this strange thing, and, I w- and I'm testifying that I saw it. So, f- so the most important thing about it is it confirms that Jesus was absolutely dead. Uh, you know, there's a lot of kooky theories around that Jesus survived somehow, and they revived him. They, after being crucified for six hours, they took him out, and they pumped him up and put makeup on him or something and had him show up on Easter morning and say, oh, I'm okay. But um, that's sort of silly in itself. But but the spear thrust is what proves that that can't even be true and, and seeing this all flow out of him. So that's clear. So at the very least, John is a special eyewitness testimony um, validating that Jesus was as dead as dead can be. And the fact that they didn't break his legs proves that as well. So Jesus died for our sins. Jesus accomplished salvation for all who come to him. These witnesses confirm it. The darkness, the massive veil in the temple rent asunder. The earthquake, the tombs opened, the dead saints awakened, the crowd beating their breasts as they headed home because of having seen these things, the blood and the water. 
the centurion's words. All of these bear witness to this wonderful thing that God was doing on that very, very special day. So, it, so it was that a, a routine execution changed the world. And these witnesses and the fruit that comes from these events proclaim that there was absolutely nothing routine about this execution. Think about it. Three poor men are executed in a far-flung province of an empire and one of them changed the world forever. And millions of people worship him today, 2,000 years later. Something happened that can't be explained away on that day. And these people lived it. They're bearing witness to it. They could not forget it because Jesus is unforgettable. And the experiences that happened that day are unforgettable. And if we want to put him on trial today and um, mock Jesus like they did then and say, oh, it's not true. He's just some kind of mythological character. Well, all of these witnesses speak to the fact that this was a very special day. And God was doing something wonderful. God designed it to be that way. So the death of Jesus really is, as we said last week, the center of history. It's God's perfect plan to reconcile lost souls, sinners like you and me, to reconcile them to himself. If you have resisted putting faith in Jesus, you should walk away from knowing these things, beating your breast in remorse for your own sins. Now that's not enough. You need to personally come to Jesus Confess to him that you're a sinner. Ask for his mercy. Receive his gift of salvation. And follow him as your king and your Lord. If you do that, you, because of his blood, will have direct access to God. Not only in this life, but forever. You'll be with him forever. That is the promise of the gospel. That's the good news. That's the wonderful thing all of these things bear witness to. Okay, let's pray. Our great God, we worship you for your wisdom and your mercy and you're opening that veil that rightly proclaimed our unworthiness to come into your presence. We are unworthy. We are sinful. But through the blood of your son Jesus you have opened the way. So help us to cast aside whatever keeps us from him. We pray in his name. Amen. All right. Next week. The story continues. We'll see you then.